Welcome to part 14 of this series on Moby Dick. In this lecture, we will discuss chapters 93 through 101. In chapter 93, a boy named Pip is enlisted to Stubb's boat crew because one of the crew members sprained his hand. During a whale chase, Pip jumps out of the boat after a whale frightens him by slapping the boat with its tail. Instead of retrieving Pip, Stubb orders his boat to pursue the whale. Stubb remarks that Pip, who is a black boy, is worth less in an Alabama slave market than the whale. Hereby, perhaps, Stubb indirectly hinted that though man loved his fellow, yet man is a money-making animal, which propensity too often interferes with his benevolence. Though the Pequot eventually saves Pip, the young boy is never the same. He stares into space and talks incoherently. In chapter 94, Ishmael explains that spermaceti congeals into a solid after a short period of time, and that the sailors must squeeze it to revert it to its liquid state. Ishmael's description is filled with puns and has an overtly sexual tone. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze all the morning long. I squeezed that sperm till I myself almost melted into it. I squeezed that sperm till a strange sort of insanity came over me, and I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co-laborer's hands in it, mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. Such an abounding, affectionate, friendly, loving feeling did this avocation beget, that at last I was continually squeezing their hands and looking up into their eyes sentimentally, as much as to say, Oh, my dear fellow beings, why should we longer cherish any social acerbities, or know the slightest ill humor or envy? Come, let us squeeze hands all around. Nay, let us all squeeze ourselves into each other. Let us squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. In chapter 95, Ishmael describes the whale's penis, longer than a Kentuckian is tall, nigh a foot in diameter at the base, and jet black as Yojo, the ebony idol of Queequeg. He humorously calls it a cassock, which is the wardrobe of clergymen, because the whaler's mincer wears the skin of the whale's penis while cutting the whale's blubber, because it protects him from the sharp tools and boiling oil. In chapter 96, Ishmael recounts a night on the Pequod when he was at the helm of the ship, observing the other crew members at work cutting and boiling the whale's blubber. Ishmael describes the hellish scene and how it inspired fearful hallucinations of hell within him. But he recovers from his reverie and concludes that fire is deceitful. Look not too long in the face of the fire, O man. Never dream with thy hand on the helm. Turn not thy back to the compass. Accept the first hint of the hitching tiller. Believe not the artificial fire, when its redness makes all things look ghastly. Tomorrow, in the natural sun, the skies will be bright. Those who glare like devils in the forking flames, the morn will show in far other, at least gentler relief. The glorious, golden, glad sun, the only true lamp, all others but liars. In chapter 97, Ishmael compares a whaling ship to a sacred temple. He notes that both structures are continuously lighted. Had you descended from the Pequod's triworks to the Pequod's forecastle, where the off-duty watch were sleeping, for one single moment you would have almost thought you were standing in some illuminated shrine of canonized kings and counselors. The whaleman, as he seeks the food of light, so he lives in light. Light is often used in literature as a symbol of truth. Thus Melville likens whalers to philosophers who seek light slash truth. In chapter 98, Ishmael discusses the pristine condition of a whaling ship after a crew processes a whale. The spermaceti and oil from the whale act as cleaning agents, rendering the ship spotless. However, Ishmael notes that just as soon as one whale is processed, another one is spotted, and the crew gives chase yet again. Yet this is life, for hardly have we mortals by long toilings extracted from this world's vast bulk its small but valuable sperm, and then, with weary patience, cleansed ourselves from its defilements, and learn to live here in clean tabernacles of the soul, hardly is this done when, there she blows, the ghost is spouted up, and away we sail to fight some other world, and go through young life's old routine again. In chapter 99, several members of the crew analyze the doubloon which Ahab fastened to the main mast, and which Ahab will reward to the sailor who spots Moby Dick. On its round border it bore the letters, Republica del Ecuador, Quito. Zoned by those letters, you saw the likeness of three Andes summits, from one a flame, a tower on another, on the third a crowing cock, while arcing over all was a segment of the partitioned zodiac, the signs all marked with their usual cabalistics, and the keystone sun entering the equinoctial point at Libra. 
Each crew member expresses his own interpretation of the coin, and Stubb reflects that the coin is like the world. People interpret the meaning of the world just as they interpret the meaning of the coin. In Chapter 100, the Pequod encounters another ship called the Samuel Enderby of England. The captain recently lost his arm to Moby Dick, and Ahab eagerly greets the captain. Aye, aye, hearty, let us shake bones together, an arm and a leg, an arm that never can shrink, do you see, and a leg that never can run. Unlike Ahab, however, the captain does not plan to seek vengeance against Moby Dick. In fact, he spied Moby Dick several weeks after he lost his limb, but refused to chase it, considering himself lucky to have lost only a limb. The contrast between Ahab and the captain of the Enderby demonstrates that tragedy often ensues from a desire for revenge. In chapter 101, Ishmael explains that the Samuel Enderby is named after an English whaleman who led the first whaling expedition into the South Seas. Ishmael notes that the English whalers are very friendly and generous with food and drink. For, say they, when cruising in an empty ship, if you can get nothing better out of the world, get a good dinner out of it at least. The English disposition emphasizes the contrast between Ahab and the English captain. While the English captain is content to consider life as a gift and something to be enjoyed, Ahab considers life as a burden and something during which one must achieve something. Don't forget to subscribe and join us for part 15 of this series on Moby Dick.